So one of the things that was a project that I went uh, when I was uh, still at WashU was we created a tool called the ADA. AD doesn't stand for anything. Um, it just was a catchy title, ADA. Um, if you want it to be ascertaining dementia, but it doesn't really mean Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so these are eight questions. They're scored yes, no. So yes, there's a change, or no, there's no change. And you add up the number of yeses. Okay? And so problems with judgment, reduced interest in hobbies or activities, repeat themselves, trouble using appliances, trouble with a month or year, trouble doing finances, appointments, and are these problems occurring daily? Okay? Now again, you're trying to capture is there a change. For the, my grandmother's 93 years old. She's sharp as a tack. She repeats herself. She's always repeated herself. <coughs> Since I was a little kid, she would tell you something. Two minutes later, she'd tell you the same thing. Another couple minutes later, she'd tell you the same thing. So for her, that's not a change. So we don't count that. We're looking for someone who didn't used to repeat themselves, who now is repeating themselves. Um, and so if you start to look at some of the properties of this, so the CDR, just so you know if you're not familiar with this, zero is not demented. 0.5 is very mildly impaired. One, two, and three is mild, moderate, and severely impaired. And you can see that people who are CDR zero, their informant rates them at less than one. But people who have even the mildest impairment, their informants rate them almost three. So we have a very natural sort of cut point around two uh, that gives us good discrimination between groups. Um, and so these are the receiver operator characteristic curves, the ROC curve, gives us discrimination. The bigger the area under the curve, the more powerful the tool is. So in our first research sample, or development sample, um, to discriminate non-demented from any demented, it was over 90% discrimination. And from uh, CDR0 versus 0.5, which is sort of the mild cognitive impairment stage, it was about 83%. And that was in that first test research sample. We then went and validated in a clinical sample, so in real world clinical practice. Um, and so we demonstrated all the different psychometric properties. Uh, so and if you know something about instrument development, there's validity and reliability, and they are quite different. And you really need to establish both, and there are multiple forms of each. Um, so you want to see how well it does against the gold standard, how well the individual questions correspond to the, um, the gold standards. Is it free from random error? Is there intra-rater reliability? So if I do it now and do it later, do I get the same score? Inter-rater reliability, that if two different people rate, do they give the same score? Intermodal reliability, so if I do it in person or over the phone, does it perform equally well? Um, and how well it discriminates. So um, suffice it to say, without going through all this, it does really well. Um, and so in real world practice, we're able to discriminate about 92% of individuals. Um, and it works well regardless of the cause of dementia, Alzheimer's, vascular, Lewy body, hormonal tremble, et cetera. Uh, it doesn't matter what your characteristics are. So it, that, that works equally well by age, by gender, by race, by the type of informant that we get, by your mini mental scores, or by your CDR. So it performs really quite well. It takes about two minutes to do. So very, very brief, easy to fill out. Um, when we published this, one of the reviewers came back and said, well, that's great, but what happens if there's not an informant around to the patient rate themselves? And I'm like, well, I don't think so, but why don't we, why don't we test it? So we actually did it as a self-administered tool. And what we found was that people who were not demented rated themselves about one, which is the same as what their informants were rating them. And people who had even the mildest of impairment were rating themselves about three, which is what the informants were rating them. So we did a really good job of discriminating. What you'll see here, if you look at the pattern closely though, as people become more demented, the informants rate more symptoms, but the person doesn't. So individuals can pick up impairment, but they can't rate the severity of their impairment. Okay. So and this is important because there's this concept of called anasaga nodu, which means people are unable to recognize their cognitive deficit. And that's not true. They recognize there's a problem, they just can't rate the severity and frequency of the problem, but they can tell you that things have changed. Uh, and so one other way to look at this is something called effect size. Uh, and so the idea is that you want to see how well the two groups can be discriminated. The bigger the effect, the more powerful the tool. Okay? Um, and so from the informant version, the effect size is 166%. So it's a very large effect, very easy to discriminate from impaired from non-impaired. 
but even from the participants' perspective, um, it's almost 100%. So, very large effect size. Now, I'm not discounting using the pencil and paper test. It's valuable to see how people perform. But I talked about the limitations of that. What happens if we combine an informing interview with a brief performance test? Can we improve our ability to pick up disease? And in fact, we can. So if we combine the 88 plus like a wordless recall kind of task, um, we've now discriminated about 97% of individuals against the gold standard. Um, and for MCI, about 91%. So very powerful tools doing very, very brief tests. It's tapping into different aspects of cognitive impairment. <coughs> Um, the other thing we wanted to demonstrate is whether these changes in these tests correspond to biomarkers, right? In other words, if we have a test that says someone likely has Alzheimer's disease, do they in fact actually have Alzheimer's disease? Um, and so we looked at both uh, amyloid imaging and CSF biomarkers. And what we found was if your ADA score was less than two, your biomarkers were all in the normal range. And if you had an ADA score of two or greater, they were all in the Alzheimer range. These were highly statistically significant differences. Okay. So people who have 88 scores of three have high CSF tau and phospho tau, low CSF A beta, and they have amyloid depositions by PET scans. Um, and so the 88, this little eight item questionnaire, performed as well as the full CDR. Right? So we go from two hours to two minutes and perform equally well in terms of discriminating. Uh, individuals. Um, the mini mental state does okay, but when you eliminate anything past the very mild cases, then the mini mental state no longer does a good job. So the mini mental state is not good at discriminating very mild uh, disease. And so one of the ways I'll just show you how that works is we did something called the sensitivity analysis. So we looked at the 88 and mini mental scores across multiple things. So gold standard ratings of whether they were demented or not, their logical memory test on their neuropsych testing, which is an episodic memory test. Their PIB binding or their amyloid binding on the PET scan and their CSFA beta. Um, and so if we use the traditional cutoff for both tests, that's the red line. The 88, we only have five false negatives. That means we only bit five people who were actually impaired with the screening. To use the mini mental state exam, we missed 74 people within the same sample. Okay? So that's a whole lot of people who were impaired that we call normal, which means they're going to have a delayed diagnosis and a delayed intervention. 